Looking to get into the art world? Don't know where to start? We brought back Max Davidson. Max is going to be with us today on another episode of Money in the Bank with Frank, and we're going to talk about that and more. Yeah, so um, new clients are always uh, are always interesting because um, you, for the most part, are going in cold. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's like dating, you know. Um, well, I like the looks of this person because they want to collect art, so that's sort of the uh, that, that's sort of the attractive scale. And then you really have to sort of get into the really important stuff, which is um, what do you want to collect? Um, do you have do you have any idea what you want to collect? Mm -hmm. um, or do you want to just collect something? Um, and if you want to collect something that I, you know, am not an expert in or that I can sort of point you into the right direction, but for the most part, people want to come to you because they know you do a certain type of art or a certain type of, you know, collecting feel. And they come to you because they've heard from word of mouth or a friend of yours told them or whatever. Um, so, Sometimes the ice is broken, other times it's not. And um, this so is for, where you should have. Great. Sorry, for, yeah, for background, so somebody that gets a referral to you, what's your background? What do they say? Is like, hey, I heard about you because. I heard about you because you, uh, you had a gallery for years and you been, you worked for the auction houses and you've been an advisor uh, for collections and artists and whatnot for the last, you know, 30 years. Um, I would love some help um, in putting together a few things for a new house we're building, or um, even if it's on the non-decorative side, you know, I, I really would like to build a collection of things that um, I one day want to give to the such and such university museum because I went there and I want to give something back. Got it. Um, the sort of the sort of the possibilities are, are endless. I mean, I, I have a client right now who's giving his entire collection to a museum. Um, it was something that he planned to do from the day he started. Um, he, he, he went in, um, and said, you know, I'd, I'd like to spend, you know, five or $10 million over the next whatever amount of years collecting works on paper. And that was, you know, hundred, you know, maybe a hundred million dollars ago. So, um, you know, there, there are, there are audibles that are called while you're collecting with someone, <laughs> you know, uh, once the so-called hook is in the mouth. Uh, you know, like anything, art is can be addictive. And um, once someone has the sort of uh, passion about it and really sort of starts enjoying the process, then you know it's it's all bets are off, and you just go and it's sort of fluid, and you have fun with it. Um, and that's sort of what I always try and tell people when I start with them is like, look, this is supposed to be fun. I don't, I don't ever want you to be stressed about this. It's not, <laughs> You know, this is, this is, um, you know, we're painting dreams here. We're not, you know, we're not get started with world peace. You know, yes, at the end of the, at the end of the journey, we may be, we may be donating this to something that's really going to help. Um, and that's always obviously very gratifying, but, you know, for the most part, this is, uh, a very pleasurable, I, I feel important, but a dalliance. And, um, you know, I try and treat people knowing that this is not a necessity of life. And because it's not a necessity, I need to make it as enjoyable as possible. You know, yeah. um, going, to the, going to the doctor is a necessity. Going to the dentist is a necessity. For that reason, it becomes a drag and not fun. This is not, this is not that. <laughs> uh, you, what you want is to have the person, you know, get so into it that it becomes a necessity to have that painting, to have that, you know, Max, we got to get that, you know. Right. Um, how, how high should I go at auction? That's where I'm sort of like, no, you know. Slow down. You see? I thought I could mistake. Yeah. Right. That's great. So do you specialize or do you like a specific period? What's your favorite? Yeah. Uh, so so my my field or I don't want to say area of expertise because that comes off so horribly. But, um, but, I, but, I, but I've been, you know, dealing with studying, reading, looking at art basically from 
um, the Civil War until five minutes ago for for the most of my natural born life, Um, mostly in the American and European arenas. Um, uh, I'm do I have favorites? Of course. But what I advise in is basically 165 or 175 years of of what I call the sort of, you know, post industrial painting age, the, you know, everything from, from Appomattox on. Okay. And mostly, uh, and you, I, I know that you mentioned that you do, uh, not just paintings, but you do. No. Motion. Um, yeah. I, I've been, I've been, I've been, a. have loved and, followed and uh, dealt in three-dimensional art for a long time, whether it's sculpture, whether it's kinetic sculpture, whether it's, um, you know, there's, you know, a litany of sculpture over the last sort of hundred years that, that are, you know, I find to be for me personally, very interesting. And I've tried to push that onto um, people that, that, that come to me for advice and for, Oh, you know, which, which, like, which I buy. I'm yeah. like, you have a yard. Um, so, um, <laughs> so okay so joined by a friend here um that's so. great that's right never be on uh never be on a show with babies or pets right because <laughs> yeah exactly that tail is just gonna sit there uh, was um yeah. So, so yeah um, so assuming that i'm a you know a newer client i walk in the door history uh of appreciation of, of art, a uh, very bright house. I love, you know, the impressionist, you, you know, my, 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 my past, what I loved, yeah. you know, Goya and stuff, Modigliani, but, uh, you know, I also love, you know, some of the modern art as well, you know, uh, not opposed to Miro. I love Modigliani. I know that's a little older than what you, yeah, no. So Modigliani is, um, you know, he's a hero and he's, uh, you know, he's, a, he's one, the first ballot hall of famer. Um, one of my and, favorites of all time. Yeah, right? it's, it's, yeah. Um, I, I think also the story of Modigliani is amazing too. I mean, he, he would paint two paintings on a canvas. He was so poor. Um, and, um, you know, he, he also had this sort of classic artist tale of the wife, painting the wife and the muse. Um, and, um, the sort of way he looked at ancient art and applied that into his work, this sort of obsession with cyclonic idols and, um, sort of, uh, you know, ancient statues and things like that. Um, you know, he's, he's fascinating. He also died extremely young. So, um, there's not a lot of it out there. Um, again, it's another artist that, that, you do see some problems with authentication, so you have to be really careful. There's, um, you know, there's there is one there's one basic book called Chironi, which is what you want the piece you're after to be in. But you know, it's not it's not it's not a bible, but it's it's the Modigliani. You do have to be careful, uh, certainly at, at the prices you have to pay for Modigliani. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna shoot a little lower. <laughs> yeah. You go on Sheila. I don't know what you you so, anyway. Yeah, uh, Sheila's Sheila's great too. I mean, so. You're you're sort of in the same years now. You're in the 20s and 30s mm-hmm. in Europe, which mm-hmm. are you know just sort of the most amazing uh, years of art uh, pre Bauhaus, and it, uh, in, it we're in between the two Bauhauses, and then you know Germany's does what they do and ruins everything. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's um, it's those artists are 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 all painting from sort of poverty and doing it anyway when you know life was a lot more difficult back then so that's why i think some of that art is so good because it's done at a time when um you know it was sort of really brave to be an artist uh, sure. you know uh, and again you know anytime you're sort of into collecting and and, and you start Banding names like that about it, it becomes a lot easier because mm-hmm. the the sort of collectability of them is pretty foolproof. You know, it's 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 you know, 
you, you get then you get into what well, what's a what's a good chila versus a bad chila or one that will hold its value, one that hasn't been all over the market. There are sort of then there are sort of subcategories you go into. And once you've decided that you like Modigliani and Sheila and Molinaj and all these great artists from that time, you know, you're off to a good start. You you um you will just now then at least you've well. narrowed your field of view, right? You've narrowed exactly. the kind of yes. like what you're that, looking that's for. Super important. You know, I, I don't mind collections that that cross eras. And mm-hmm. in fact, I think that they're really interesting. But there are some collections that are narrow that are just spectacular in the sort of careful, meticulous, uh, uh, you know, pinpoint accuracy of the time that they want to collect. And they've got every artist from that period, you know, and, you know, I've seen collections that, that will span 10 years uh, to collections that, you know, span 150 years or collections that span thousands of years, you know. Um, so, uh there's no right or wrong with collecting there's no there's no um well you shouldn't collect these and you know i mean there are things i think are safer than others i think there are things that um are riskier than others but you know if you, if you like it and you 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 have to have it it's it's hard to it's hard to turn someone off from that. yeah it's a it's a, a beautiful cash freezer hopefully right yeah I think so. Yeah. I mean, again, we, you know, we, you and I have spoken about this offline that, you know, it really is one of the few investments that you really can enjoy. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's sort of the, the great asterisks about art is that, yeah, sure. It helps to have someone who knows what they're doing when they collect, but that's really not any different than say what you do, which is advising people on, financial decisions, whether it's stocks, bonds, you know, treasuries, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's, that is, that is the glory of art is, 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 you know, I get to look at it. Yay. You know, um, and it's there every day. And it's a reminder that I bought that with my father many years ago. So what's that story? Tell us that story. What's that piece? Tell us about that one. So that, that, that is a very early work by a, a British artist. I was going to say a young British artist, but he's not that young anymore. Named Gavin Turk, um, who is a, what's called a, a, a sensationalist artist. Um, he was at schools uh, in London in the 80s and 90s um, with um, uh, Damien Hirst and um, a lot of those sort of sensationalist British artists from the time. Um, and uh, Gavin was famous for when he was at college um, and uh, was, I think he was at uh, Royal College of London or uh, Royal Academy, you know, they have a big thesis at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And um, he had a room to fill and put a one of those blue uh, plaques that you see uh, in London, uh, you know, that, Dickens lived here. Yeah, whatever. yeah. And and his senior project was, or his, it's not a senior, but his last project was putting one of those in a, a huge room. It said Gavin Turk painted here, um, and he was either thrown out or failed or whatever. <laughs> I hope they um, kept the plaque. <laughs> so, yeah, so he's a, so he's sort of a provocateur in, in a way. And um, this was a painting that, that my father and I saw at. Um, an art fair in New York, but it was with White Cube. Um, and um, we just loved the painting. And my mom is British. And even though it has a bit of a negative connotation in Britain, it was just so beautifully painted, this large white canvas with a draped British flag on it. And it was sort of the way Gavin viewed England at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, limp or whatever. And, but I just love the painting. So yeah. a great example of sort of, I collected this, um, because I loved the image and I just loved the way it looked rather than sort of what it meant. Um, and so, it still turned into something worthwhile having. Yay. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, Gavin's, Gavin's bounced around. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's, I've met him a couple of times, he's a super interesting guy and, yeah. um, has, has, has done some really cool things. So yeah, on that front, again, with the bright theme on, uh, the house, the bright colors, loving that kind of idea of those two types of artists, watercolors, paintings. 
what other what how else would you dive into a new client? Well, I think I think I I think a question I would ask then, you know, even though it's it's it is sort of the um, elephant in the room is what's your budget? How, yeah, how much do you want to spend? <laughs> right. I'm I'm amazing at spending people's money. Sure. Um, and I can I can spend five thousand, fifty thousand, or five million. I just want to know if it is fifty thousand. Is that for three works of art, or is that for one work of art? Um, I, I have a client right now, who are dear friends, and they have a small budget for three paintings. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they like is, I would say, at least three quarters of the budget. And so that's going to make the other two things really hard. So what we're discussing now is like, do we do we have to kill all three spaces at the same time? Is it worth spending three quarters of the budget? That's something you really love right now and waiting or putting a picture of the kids up or, you, you know, yeah, there, there yeah. Are we, don't, we don't have to have black walls. You know, I saw a mirror, village, village mercantile we could put there. It was $800, you know? Um, oh my God. That so, place is awesome. Yeah. yeah so, so, so there, so there's, there are, there are, there are things I do that, that, that try and work around that. You know, and then and then there's the client or two. I don't have as many as I'd like that are. I, I don't care. I just want to make sure it's a really good collection. You know, and you know, what's the budget? Ah, don't worry about that. We'll you know we'll we'll worry about that when it happens. So hell, I need a loan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, know, you have come to the wrong place for that. Um, <laughs> that's uh, that's not that's not what I'm good at. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, that goes back into the fractional ownership idea, right? Um, right. Exactly. So so under the assumption that you finally get a budget out of somebody, let's say that they have mm -hmm. budget of a hundred grand but, on, uh, you know, whatever, a few pieces of art, just built a barn dominium, uh, wanted to represent, uh, you know, two. Well, I mean, I guess at that point, does it go into like a design idea? Does it go into because you mentioned like first of all. You know, there could be any reason that you want to do it. You may be doing it specifically, as you said, like as a cash freezer where it's like, I want to collect art and I want to put it away, store it and collect you know, it. Good, you know, good art storage yourself. You get asked yeah. that all the time. Yeah, sure I do. And then the, uh, other, and the other part could be that you want it for personal consumption. What are some different use cases that people will use art for? Like business, it pops into my head, right? So. Yeah. And then the other one is we just built this house. I mean, that's probably the most common, you know, we just built this house. We have spent a lot of money on it um and it's pointless to have this beautiful house i have nothing on the walls mm. and we don't want just pictures of our kids and we don't want you know the posters that you know of you know of this concert we went to when we were kids like you know they're, yeah. so they, they're taking they're taking the wall covering to the next level um we have this big yard is there anything you can put out there it seems silly to not have anything out there the kids wow. don't play out there you know, yeah. it sounds it sounds very functional, but it's the truth. I mean, art is lived with. Art needs to 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 be walked around. You know, I, I tell the story of when I worked at Christie's. Um, I worked on the Gan sale, which was the first major single owner bonanza, two hundred million dollar sale. Um, and uh, I got to know the kids. Uh, who were you know, older than me at the time, but they were, you know, they were, they had inherited this collection and there was no way they could keep it because it was $200 million worth of art. Um, yeah. And they used to tell me about how they would run down the stairs of the Sutton Place apartment, whipping tennis balls at each other. Oh my with, God. Yeah. With right. Picasso Spendalger, you know, right there. And, you know, Matisse here. And, and you know, I, I wasn't a guest because I grew up in a house where my parents collected ceramics. Right. So, you know, I had two brothers and we, you know, recreate the 86 Super Bowl in the hallway with, <laughs> you know, ceramic jugs. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's not, it's not, um, it's not something to, to be cavalier about, but I really find that art should be lived with sort of, you know, lived with it. it don't it, tiptoeing around art is crazy, and yeah. you shouldn't have it in your house if it's going to cause you the stress of not being able to go near it. 
know. Yeah, that, um, that was one of the things that I noticed when uh, down in Miami that there was like obviously obviously there was <clears throat> kinetic structures and there was also just obelisks and different things and a couple of them looked really sharp, like physically yeah. sharp. I was like, yeah, I'm not for kids. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I. We, we did a lot of art fairs when uh, I've done a lot of art fairs in my time. And it got to the point where we used to put on the pedestals, do not touch or blow. Mm -hmm. uh, and because, you know, I, I never worried about kids coming in and touching art. I worried about the parents allowing the kids to touch the art. Uh, it. You know, it, so it, it was always that. So it was always the adult that wound up knocking something over never the kid uh, <laughs> uh, so uh you know in, in our house like my kids just know like yeah, you don't run your hand over yeah you, you grow up with it you learn yeah, its value exactly. it's like kid yeah. out in the country with a with a weapon versus a kid in the city right so there's there's right. there's a yeah. lot of that um going back to that comment that you made something that's been like just rattling around in my head is like you know generational art dealing family but you still mm -hmm. ran the rungs of going through the deal. Like, what was your history? Where, how did you come up in, in the art world other than, because you didn't just go straight to the gallery. You, you said that you went through auction houses. You've done, you've so, you run the gamut, right? Right. So when I graduated um, from college, I sort of, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in the art world, mm -hmm. studied art history. And um, I sort of thought, yeah, I'll go work with dad. You know, um, and he he did not want me to do that, which you know, I'm, I'm happy he did because he said, you know, I would go I would go work for the auction houses if you can and um, come up that way and see see the other side of of the art world, see the see the macro side of the art world. I'm the micro side. Here. Mm -hmm. We're a family business. Sure, we're, we do well and we have a nice gallery and people like us, we have a good reputation. But you should go work for, you know, you should go work in the belly of the beast. Um, and so I, I went to Christie's and I worked there for almost four years. And my first job there was basically slinging catalogs behind the front counter and greeting people as they came in, getting them to their appointments. And what Christie's did, which was different back in the day, which was what I loved about this job was unless you had a firm appointment with a specialist upstairs, people would bring their stuff in. Um, and you would have to sort of decipher which department to get it to. Um, and I'll never forget, um, I was pretty much alone on the desk one day and these two ladies came in um, with a painting sort of roughly to 40 by 20. And um, they had no idea what they had. They had found it in the attic of, a, of their church up in Harlem. And uh, they asked me, you know, if you know, they, it, it had said that someone had told them in passing that it was valuable. And so they brought it to us. And it was Maxfield Parish. And we sold it for, I think, $350,000 a couple of months later. And, you know, built a new wing in the church, basically. <laughs> um, and so there were a lot of stories like that story of a sort of a Fabergé egg that this person brought in. Everyone had told him, was, that's not a Fabergé egg. Fake or sure enough, it was a Fabergé egg. And yeah. once the, Fab the Russian objects of Vertu came down and saw it, they were like, oh yeah, this is, you know, and I think it was the cover lot of the sale. So I got to see a lot of art and, and, and objects that I never would have seen just going to the gallery and, right. you know, Looking at Carol Anthony paintings with my dad, you know, um, and so that was really valuable. I met a lot of people, I met a lot of art people, a lot of professional, you know, in the trade. Um, and then four years later, I just couldn't take being paid that little anymore, <laughs> and I, uh, I went to work uh, with my father, and that was, you know, I still basically work with him. You know, he and I still do things together. I think there's a lot of value in that type of experience, especially like I take on a intern, usually in their junior or senior year of college. And then when they graduate, a lot of times they'll try to come and work for me because they really enjoyed it or liked it. And I always, always defer them to, you know, I'll give them a referral, I'll give them, you know, 
potentially, uh, you know, a lead intro to one of the bigger firms. Because I do believe that when you have a variance of experience, especially in the financial services world, you will see so much more by being that cornerstone company, being at a big retail establishment that has protocols, but people, you know, that name usually will garner trust, which gives you the access to see or do a lot of different interesting things, but also usually has structure to it. And then you'll appreciate more when there's not structure, you still know what needs to happen in order to run that business. So Max, if someone were to come in asking a different question, let's say that somebody came in to you and said, hey, I'm a collector and I just want to start a collection for, for investment purposes. How, do you, how, would you, how would you handle that one differently or would it be the same? First, I, I think, yes, I think the first question would, would, what I would say is, have you seen something you liked? Is there something you want me to look at? Because normally people don't just kind of like, oh, I want to click dart. You know, it's like, it's people really would like, I think, approval on maybe something they've already seen. If they haven't, then I would say, can, um, you, can you name three or four artists that uh, you've seen that you really like? that I could look at that may give me a sense of sort of what you're thinking. Great, great. If you want more little snippets like that, feel free to join us back on the merge a little more. Hey, Max, it was honestly, it was a great, uh, great conversation. We will uh, table this and get back to it in a couple of weeks. I know we'll have you, not next weekend, you'll be out of town, but uh, weekend after that, we'll have you back for round two. Great, I can't wait. Um, if there's anything you want to redo, because this dog over here, then I will, uh, Happily get on with you again. Totally <laughs> fine. Yeah, no, that's cool. I just wanted to make it like sound biteable. But yeah, no, that's totally cool. We have a we wrap up here at the one, so they're gonna kick me out. So I just wanted to uh -huh. say thanks. Oh, I will we'll chat offline. I'll I'll give you a buzz a little later on my cell about the uh, the other thing that we'll uh, okay. figure have out. A great holiday. Thank Take you. Care. Happy holidays. Take care. Hey, thanks for watching the merge. We've got a ton more stuff for you to watch on YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok, everywhere. Check us out.